if Trump wins that election, obviously those two people will have less influence. Elizabeth Warren will still be in the Congress, but Gary Gensler will no longer be the SEC chairman. So there'll be a new group of elites that are running the SEC. So um, the question is, though, will that be better or not? I don't honestly know the answer because Donald Trump has spoken very negatively about Bitcoin. This content is brought to you by Uphold, which is a great crypto platform that I've been using since 2018. Uphold has all the top cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin and all the altcoins. In fact, they have 260 plus cryptocurrencies on their platform. You can also trade precious metals, stable coins, and 37 fiat currencies. In addition, they are available in over 150 countries. And this platform is fully reserved. They do audits. So you can trust that your funds are safe. No commingling, no lending out your funds. If you'd like to learn more about Uphold, please visit the link in the description. Welcome to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. I have with me today Anthony Scaramucci, who's the founder of Skybridge Capital and Salt Conference, as well as an author. Anthony, great to have you back on. It's great to be here with you, man. I love I love your whole setup. I like the bowl in the background. Of course, I like your Bitcoin clock when it's blinking green. <laughs> and heading north, but uh, uh, God bless you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, Anthony, you know I'm a big fan. We've talking, uh, we've spoken over the years. Um, I noticed you just got back from Davos. Uh, how was it? And were there any major takeaways for you? Well, you know, let me set the scene for you though. In 2023, when I got back from Davos, I was interviewed by Bill Cohen from Puck. He said, what'd you learn in Davos? I said, well, Bitcoin's going up. And he said, well, what, what do you mean by that? I said, well, I didn't meet a person at Davos. I didn't meet a member of the white badge delegation. Those are the people that you know are the diplomats and the heads of state and policymakers and central bankers and CEOs of large companies. I didn't meet one of those people that liked Bitcoin or thought Bitcoin had any legs in mm -hmm. fact, many of those people were telling me that Bitcoin was a dead asset and it was a road to nowhere and soon to be a ghost chain. And so uh, what I find about Davos is the collective wisdom of the elites, because they're trying to impress each other. And, you know, that was the trend at the time. They all hopped out on that and they got it wrong. And so this year uh, there was a muted situation in Davos. So meaning if you talk to somebody and say, oh, I hear Bitcoin had a great year, but really who cares? It's an insignificant asset and the blockchain itself is insignificant and Web3 is not going anywhere and we're traditional finance people. And then of course, Jamie Dimon mm -hmm. gave a pretty high profile interview on CNBC where he routed Bitcoin and other blockchain oriented assets. So I take all of that is extremely positive. And so that's just my view. I feel like we're going to have another great year in Bitcoin, uh, not just because of the ETF and the halving, but because we still have fence sitters and naysayers. Mm -hmm. And the way markets work, Tone, is that you got fence sitters and naysayers. Uh, as they come off the fence and they stop naysaying, the price goes up. Right. If you have no fence sitters and you have no naysayers, and you and I got to be worried, we got to talk about that being a top. And Anthony, I almost treat Jamie Dimon now as like a contrarian indicator. Like if he's continuing his FUD, I am bullish because I watched this man since 2017 say the same thing and same thing, but Bitcoin continues to grow in price and adoption. Now we have the ETFs, it's historic. So it's like, okay, Jamie, uh, continue, please. Yeah, well, listen, I mean, he's one of the smartest people in finance, so... Uh, but he's got a vested interest in what he's doing. And he's also got a way of thinking that has made him and his family over a billion dollars. He's arguably one of the most successful financial services executives in U.S. economic history, sitting on top of, uh, you know, largest, most successful bank uh, in history of the United States. Mm -hmm. So I have an enormous amount of respect for him. But what I do find with people like Jamie of his vintage, of his era, and I think Jamie's 67 now, if you don't do the homework on Bitcoin, 
and you're opining on it, you're probably opining negatively because of your life experience. But if you do the homework and contemporaries of Jamie would include people like Stan Druckenmiller, yeah. Paul Tudor Jones, Ray Dalio, uh, those men, they did the homework on Bitcoin and they drew a different con conclusion. And I would, I would say something to you that I would hope your viewers and listeners would contemplate. The more homework you do on Bitcoin, the more you go towards Bitcoin. I sort of feel like Bitcoin research and Bitcoin due diligence is a one-way ticket towards Bitcoin. I have yet to find somebody that says, you know, I read everything, I got steeped in the understanding of the code, I got steeped in the understanding of the network and the decentralized nature of the network and the fact that it hasn't been hacked and has been up and running for 14 years. I, I, I did all the work and I hate Bitcoin. I have yet to hear anybody do that. So, uh, you know, we'll get there. You know, Jay, Jamie's an example of somebody that probably would needs to do the homework. Sure. Uh, Larry Fink, on the other hand, you know, two years ago, I met with Larry in Abu Dhabi. Mm. And we were in the lobby of the Four Seasons Hotel together. He was very negative on Bitcoin. Right. And he said, well, he was positive on stable coins. He had just made an investment in Circle. But he was very, very negative on Bitcoin. And here we are two years later. He's all in. And he's talking about the tokenization of assets, the digitization of assets. And he's trying to make iBit, which is the BlackRock ETF, the largest Bitcoin ETF. In fact, if you took the 11 Bitcoin ETFs, this has been the most successful launch right. in terms of aggregate dollars in ETF history. So so I admire Larry, you know, because Larry, you know what they say, you know, smart people, when the facts change or they've been influenced by greater knowledge, they change their decisions. You know, you don't have to stay in a certain realm if that realm is no longer accurate. I can't tell you how many times in my life I've gotten something wrong. And what's the move? You got to make an adaptation and you have to admit that you're wrong and and go in a different direction. So I admire Larry Fink for that. And not to focus too much on Jamie, but at the same time, while he's saying all these things, JP Morgan is involved um, as a participant with the ETFs. They're testing DeFi with Avalanche. They've been invested in consensus, which, you know, of course, built Ethereum. So it's fascinating that these two things are happening in parallel. Is Jamie almost at the point where it would be embarrassing for him to switch his opinion because he's made yeah. such a hard stance? Okay, it's a good point. Yeah, you know, I, I I don't think so. I think Jamie's a self-confident guy, very secure. Mm -hmm. I think if he changes his opinion, he'll say, hey, I got that wrong. I'm going to change my opinion. I don't think he's going to inject too much pride into that decision-making. Um, something else is going on, actually. You know, there's pressure on him from regulators. Uh, he's Elizabeth got to Warren. deal with the Elizabeth Warrens of the world. There's pressure in the system as a traditional finance representative. Um, but listen, you know, you know this and I know this. JP Morgan, as you mentioned, they're an AP on the uh, ETFs for people. They're uh, producing research on Bitcoin. They have their own coin. They have built a element of their blockchain. You can call if you have an account at JP Morgan in the private bank, and you call them and say, hi, unsolicited, I'd like to buy $25,000, $100,000 worth of Bitcoin, something like that, no problem. They'll buy for you, and they'll put that QCIP in your account. Mm. You'll sit there with the Blackstone Bitcoin Trust in a JP Morgan account. Mm. Yeah. It's Absolutely no problem. So. Right. Yeah, well, they definitely want to make money, and uh, we'll see what else they decide to do with crypto. Um, you know, speaking of Elizabeth Warren, I would love to get your thoughts because we're going to talk a bit about politics in the upcoming election cycle. We've seen this very hard stance from Elizabeth Warren, um, obviously under the Biden administration as well. Uh, there's been a lot of knee-jerk reactions to crypto and look, maybe FTX didn't help that. Um, but then, you know, you have Gary Genser who's under the control of Elizabeth Warren. He's losing in court, but he's not giving up. You know, yeah. do you think this thing ends in, after the 2024 election? Well, you know, if if Trump wins that election, obviously those two people will have less influence. Elizabeth Warren will still be in the Congress, but Gary Gensler will no longer be the SEC chairman. So there'll be a new group of elites 
that are running the SEC. So um, the question is, though, will that be better or not? I don't honestly know the answer because Donald Trump has spoken very negatively yeah. about Bitcoin. Now, Vivek Ramaswamy has convinced Donald Trump that he should never have a central bank digital currency. So Trump is behind that now. And I think Trump also made some money on these NFTs. Yeah, I was going to ask so you So maybe, that. maybe that's going to open his mind to the world of digital assets and Web3. But I don't think 80-year-old people, Donald Trump, 75-year-old Elizabeth Warren, 80-year-old Joe Biden are the right people to make regulatory decisions about this asset class. So I don't necessarily think a Republican win is going to be better. It may end up being worse in some way. So yes. so we'll we'll have to see, you know, as it relates to crypto in general. You know, now what's really interesting is yesterday Gensler came out and said, well, despite the fact that we approved against my greater wishes, we approve the ETF. I am now letting you know that that may be the last one. I'm not, I'm not going to approve the Ethereum ETF. And, and, you know, look, there'll be lawsuits about the Ethereum ETF, but I'll just give you his brand of thinking. If he approves the ETF, then every one of those pillows behind you is going to get an ETF, you know, and, and, and um, I don't think he wants that. And so, you know, we can argue about it, you know, but I mean, and he could lose the court cases, but that doesn't mean he doesn't have tricks up his sleeve to delay this stuff. You know, that Bitcoin ETF should have been approved in 2014. Yeah. You know, and it would have saved retail investors. Uh, it created the grayscale debacle with the 2% fees and the discount and the surplus and all that stuff that happened to the grayscale Bitcoin trust because it wasn't an ETF, all of that stuff could have been avoided. But, you know, we're, we're not in it anymore for protecting the investor. We're not in it anymore for advancing financial innovation. We're in it for politics. And, and that really sucks for the country because I have met with people from around the world, particularly those in the UAE. I've met with regulators and the regulators say, yeah, no, our politicians and our ruler is agnostic Mm. to our regulatory process. If it's good for the country and it's safe and sound and it's transparent, we're good. There's nobody calling, job moaning, oh, mm. I woke up this morning, don't like crypto, let's ban Bitcoin in a country that has 22% of the world's GDP. Mm. Now, these ETFs going live, uh, certainly historic, do you feel we've crossed the chasm of... Uh, you know, Bitcoin and crypto going mainstream. There's there's no longer any type of hesitation or psychological barrier. You know, oh, I, I don't know about this stuff, right? Or it's too complicated for me to try to buy it on Coinbase. But now it's, hey, BlackRock has it. Fidelity has it. I, I know these names. I trust these names. Hi, everyone. Pardon the interruption. I'm Tony Edward, the founder and host of the Thinking Crypto podcast. I have a huge favor to ask you. If you haven't subscribed as yet on YouTube or the podcast platforms, hit that subscribe button, hit the thumbs up button, hit the notification bell on the YouTube platform. And on Spotify or Apple or wherever you get your podcasts, please leave a five-star rating and review. It supports the podcast. It allows me to bring great quality content to you. Thank you for your support. And I'll let you get back to the content. Really, really, really good question. And so I think we have crossed that chasm. I think the sloppiness is from the price differentials. Okay, so if I own the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust and it's finally traded back to par and I bought it at a loss, maybe I bought those coins at 50, 60,000, uh, my proclivity is going to be to sell those coins. And if I want to stay in Bitcoin to buy the Bitcoin ETF after I've sold that. And so you're seeing a tremendous amount of sloppiness. You know, I think there was another $400 million worth of Bitcoin on chain this morning moved from the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust into a, an exchange to liquidate that. And I think they're going to have heavy, heavy selling. Now you'd say to yourself, well, why did they go from 2% to one and a half, everyone's out, out is at 20 basis points. 
I think they need the fees. And I think they're making the bet that there's a lot of people that have low cost tax lots, low cost tax basis, and are not going to necessarily sell to save 120 basis points, which is the net differential between the fees of the ETF and Grayscale. Mm. Do you feel that, and, and I want to make sure I phrase this question correctly, that it's almost like the crypto startups, the kids, so to speak, are being put to bed and the adults, the Wall Street firms are here, with, maybe with the exception of Coinbase, because Coinbase has gone public. It's shown it, it's a reputable business and company. Um, they partner with BlackRock, but Binance, it looks like you know they're going to be under scrutiny and uh, the biggest fine, I think it is, in settlement. Um, and you have all these other firms like Grayscale seeming like they're losing market share now. Really good question. So, so I obviously think Coinbase is going to be fine. I think that they are such a big part of the crypto ecosystem and all of these ETFs are transacting with Coinbase. Mm -hmm. uh, Coinbase has an interesting lawsuit going on right now vis-a-vis uh, -vis the SEC. It sounds like the judge is very well prepared asking super smart questions related to that lawsuit. It, it could come to pass, Tony, where the SEC loses another case. Could you imagine that? I mean, they would, they would have lost the Ripple case. They would have lost the Grayscale case. They'd lose the Coinbase case. I think at that point, it's a little embarrassing for them in terms of the way they're administrating the laws. I think it's prima facie. They're acting as politicians and they're being politically influenced more than they are adhering to or following the law. Mm. Uh, but when you talk about grownups in the room, uh, Coinbase will have its market share. JP Morgan, despite the sentiments shared by Jamie Dimon, will have its more market share. Goldman has gotten into the mix. And yes, I think that the asset class is growing up. I don't think some of the larger baby companies, to use your analogy, are going to get hurt that badly. Because mm -hmm. I just think it's just going to be overall growth in the ecosystem. But, you know, it's not going to surprise me if we're sitting here a year from now and the biggest brokerage firms have Bitcoin available as an investment. The wire houses have approved it for their core portfolios. You know, you could have somebody like BlackRock and their total return portfolio. Uh, it's a $2 trillion portfolio. They say, okay, we want a 1% exposure. It's $200 billion in Bitcoin. Just think of the magnitude of that, right? Mm. So wow. maybe we'll the portfolio uh, uh, arrangement will eventually be 60, 30, 10, <laughs> 10 going maybe. to Bitcoin. <laughs> we don't know. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, I just think it's amazing. I think you can't see the future, mm. but if the future is exponential, like you and I both believe, then it's very bright. The question is what's going to happen near term? I don't know the answer to that, but. Are we sitting here at an all-time high between now and the end of the year? We have 11 and a half months to go, and we have a big halving cycle taking place in April. Could Bitcoin get through the $69,000 level mm. by the end of the year? I believe it will. Yeah. Selling think, will, will have abated from grayscale, and the machines of Wall Street will be selling this idea to their clients. Yeah, I, and I've been talking to quite a few of the issuers. I uh, spoke to Kathy at Ark Invest and the guys at Bitwise, and they have their marketing plans to educate RIAs and wealth managers. It's coming, man. Uh, even my own personal financial advisor, you know, I've been talking to him about it for a while. And, you know, he's like, yeah, we can't touch it, blah, blah, blah. Now that the ETFs are live, it's a different story. Everybody's yeah. curious. <laughs> Very well, I, mean, I mean, think about all the road that we have ahead of us, right? I mean, the the road to get here, all of these early adapters are being rewarded because it's now going mainstream, but you're just getting started on the mainstream road. You know, to put it into the context, there's only 4.5% adoption globally. That's roughly where we were in the middle of 1998 for the internet and web one. So just imagine where we'll be in 10 or 15 years. Yeah, absolutely. You'll still be a nice young pup. <laughs> I'll be fighting to keep my hairline. <laughs>
Okay, that's <laughs> what I'll be doing. Um, tell us about Skybridge's uh, strategy. I know, obviously, you guys have been uh, invested in crypto and Bitcoin, I think Ether as well. Are you adding new tokens? Are there any new things that you're looking at for 2024? Yeah, well, I you know I always I'm very open about my portfolio. I we own Casper Labs. Mm. I own a small gaming token called Vulcan Forge, the symbols PYR. We own Algorand, which we think still has great technology and just perhaps may have misfired as a layer one in terms of uh, scaling its TVL. But I think their uh, their relaunch is going to go incredibly well. Mm. We own Solana. And we own Bitcoin, and uh, we're we've been buying Avalanche. So, so to me, um, those are high quality, high, great core assets long term. Some are more speculative. Some are, are stable, like Bitcoin. And so, even though Bitcoin has an eighty to one hundred vol at times, I still see that as the granddaddy and more stable. Um, and so, for me, you know, for Skybridge, our goal educate our people, expand our market share. Uh, we have some private equity securities that we're offering, you know, through this, we have this thing called the Skybridge Unicorn Recovery Fund. We've got mm -hmm. investments in things like Klarna and Liquid Death, which we think are going to be great pre-IPO investments. We have our coin fund, which was up 160% last year. That's in a diversified group of tokens, similar to the ones that I just mentioned. Uh, and then we have our hedge fund fund of funds, which had its best year in Skybridge's history last year. Our, our offshore fund up 36, our onshore fund up 25. Uh, it's truly been a great uh, year for us. And I, I see this year as being equally good. You know, now yeah. who the hell knows? <laughs> I've been humbled by life and markets. So maybe I'll get it wrong, but if Bitcoin goes to seventy thousand this year, there'll be happy camper clients at Skybridge. Both the employees and the customers here at Skybridge will be very happy. Now, speaking of markets outlook and you know what may happen, uh, we see the Fed looks like they're going to cut this year. I don't know. Um, you know, there's a lot of speculation on maybe a cut in March. A, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and look, eventually the money printer is going to have to be turned on to print, uh, to, to pay for all the different things that are going on. They've raised the debt ceiling uh, and all these mm -hmm. different things. Uh, what is your outlook for, for the Fed and how they, they will take action? Because that has affected markets, of course. Well, it's an election year. And mm -hmm. so I'll say a couple of things. The, the, Stock Trader Almanac, 125 years of election year of observation, 85% uh, of the time the market goes up in an election year. Mm. I wouldn't bet against that trend. Secondarily, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. Um, the Fed has said that they're more or less done raising rates. Mm. Um, and it being an election year, and I know they try to be apolitical, they're sort of political. Uh, they'll probably start cutting rates. The question is, how much will they cut mm -hmm. and when? And I think when they say higher, longer, I just think it's going to be uh, lower, longer. And what do I mean by that? Probably don't cut rates until the second half of the year, mm -hmm. and then they cut them pretty quickly. Um, but I think that they'll probably leave people with an impression that they're not cutting them in the first half, and then by June, July, they'll start cutting them. Now, Anthony, the history has shown us anytime the Fed pivots and they start cutting, there is a pullback on markets. So mm -hmm. you think it's going to be, you know, maybe a short term pullback. It's going to be sharp. But like you said, it's election year. Maybe they start yeah. the money printer again and things are back to normal in a month or two. Yeah. Well, yes. You know, and the market's gone up a lot. I'm talking about the stock market. So if the Fed cuts rates and the market doesn't move a lot, it won't surprise me because it's been anticipatory. Same way Bitcoin went up a lot into the ETF news. Once it got announced, it traded a little bit sloppily. But I do believe that uh, interest rates are the physical gravity of financial assets. You lower rates, you're going to increase the value of those assets. It's just the way it works. So lower rates will mean a higher Bitcoin. Lower rates will mean a higher Ethereum. 
Um, and so it'll be generally a good thing. Will it happen instantaneously? No, but will it happen? Sure. Remember, these things are what Buffett once said, the markets are a voting machine or a popularity contest in the short term, but they're a weighing machine over long periods of time where they weigh the fundamentals of something. And so, mm. so you you could be sitting here with lower interest rates and Bitcoin set up over 100,000, not impossible. Yeah, I personally think that's what's going to happen, but I, I'm hoping I'm right. <laughs> That'd be really nice. <laughs> um, uh, question for you for the election that's coming up. Uh, I, I've seen your tweets and I know you talked about like, you don't think Trump is going to win. Do you think Biden gets reelected? And I, I'm I'm hoping, I'm praying that we get some like fresh blood, younger, like a Vivek or, or, or you know, I don't know. I, I, sometimes I get frustrated with, <laughs> with the candidates yeah, that we I mean, have. You know, look, I mean, Vivek is not going to be president. He's obviously dropped out of the race and RFK is not going to be president. He's in a third party. He's just not going to get enough for the... The vote, the question is, is Trump going to be president again? And so I don't see it because the country's gotten browner and blacker. The mosaic of the country, this beautiful, colorful mosaic of America has changed once again. It's a different country uh, than the 2006 teen version of this country. Mm -hmm. And the second thing, which I think is important, is how has he expanded his base? He's become intolerable to a very large group of people. And the Nikki Haley voter, when questioned about the election, they say, oh no, I could never vote for Trump. 43% of them said, not gonna support him in the general election. 70% of the New Hampshire people, not support, I voted for Nikki Haley, he's not getting my vote. And so mm -hmm. you need that crossover vote after a primary, you need a healing process in a party and you need the crossover vote. Reagan got it from Bush. Uh, Hillary Clinton, she did not get it from Bernie Sanders. Mm. Barack Obama did get it from Hillary Clinton. So, you know, we're here now. I have to see what happens, but, uh, you know. Do you, do you think Biden gets reelected? I do, yes. I think Biden gets reelected and, uh, you know, sort of weekend at Biden's. He's got one foot on a banana peel, the other foot in the <laughs> casket. I mean, I, I what am I going to do? But I would I would choose him over Trump because he's not a threat to the institutions of the democracy, not a threat to the rule of law. Mm. And we all benefit from the predictability of our legal system. And we benefit from the fact that nobody at the top has that much power. When Trump says he wants to seize power, be a dictator and this sort of stuff, let's take him seriously. We don't need people like that in our government. Mm. <clears throat> now, Anthony, uh, Trump did, uh, we talked about it earlier, uh, make some statements about CBDCs. And I want to get your thoughts in general, because um, there seems to be a growing need for this in the United States or a stablecoin version, maybe that's more decentralized, yeah. because other countries mm -hmm. are building their CBDCs. And if we want to maintain the US as dollar as a world reserve currency, we may need to have this. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, you know, see, I, I actually think that you can have A stable coin mm -hmm. doesn't come with all the bells and whistles of privacy invasion. And why not just go with the stable coin? Moreover, Jeremy Allaire just put out a white paper describing the benefits of having a stable coin versus a central bank digital currency. It's less threatening to the world to have a stable coin. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, it may maintain or improve the dollar supremacy. Mm -hmm. So- you know, I'm not buying that we need to have a central bank digital currency. By the way, we'll survive if we get one, but I don't think we will get one. Mm. There's still like libertarian elements in the country. And I can just tell you that they were talking about dollarization over the blockchain in 2017 when I was in the White House. Now, granted, I was only there for a short period of time, but the Fed in July of 2017, produced a white paper talking about putting the dollar up on the blockchain. Nothing happened. It's seven years later. So mm -hmm. we'll see. But I think the first move is going to probably be to use Jeremy Allaire at Circle and the USDC. Yeah. And that makes sense because it's on different blockchains is interoperability. Like you said, it's uh, more decentralized, less, you know, people will have less concerns. Yeah, and about and could be government. interoperable with those uh, governments. 
True. In some ways, that would be less threatening to those governments. Mm. Final question here. Um, you have Jerry Miller and Circle, and they're ha- they have a USDC. You have Tether uh, in the open market uh, globally, uh, the largest stablecoin. And you have companies here in the United States are launching stablecoins like PayPal. What do you think happens? It seems like a lot of stable coins are going to be popping up here and there. I know regulations are needed, but what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, if they're regulated and there's reserves behind them, just like we have a lot of banks, I don't see how we wouldn't end up with a lot of stable coins. Now, mm-hmm. having said that, will the stable coins make themselves interoperable with each other? Mm-hmm. And I'm hoping that's the case. I'm hoping that we get legislation that creates that type of clarity. So if you have a stable coin, backed in US dollar or an Algorand, and you need to flip it into an Ethereum-based stable coin. I hope we were able to make that happen for people without a lot of costs or a lot of fanfare. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think it happens. And I think the future's bright. And if you're at 4% adoption or 4.5% adoption right now, Tony, imagine what the world looks like at 9% adoption. Mm. Exciting times. Uh, Anthony, thank you for good, joining me. Good to be here, man. I like your rig. I like your backup back there. Thanks, man. I've been adding right. to it. <laughs> All right. Good luck. Take care, Anthony. Bye. Bye. 